Okay. Uh, Shada Soleimani is a 2015 graduate of the, the Cranbrook Academy of Art Photography Department, an Iranian-American artist who is the daughter of political refugees that were persecuted by the Iranian government in the early 1980s. Her work melds uh, sculpture, collage, film, and photography to highlight her critical perspective on historical and contemporary social political occurrences in uh, Iran and the greater Middle East. Um, she will also be having an opening at Library Street Collective this Saturday at 6 p.m. And stick around for the filming of her, or the screening of her film, uh, Medium of Exchange, at 7 o'clock. And so please join me in welcoming Shada. Hi. So weird being on this side of things um, since I gave my second year presentation, which was, I don't even remember how long ago. Not that long ago, but kind of long ago. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks so much to the Academy of Arts, to the photo department, and to Library Street for inviting me here to do the exhibition and arranging everything for the film screening. So I'm going to get right into it because there's a lot of material, and I talk a lot, and I talk really fast. And if the film screening at 7, then I'm going to be really fast. Um, I always kind of give a trigger warning because there are some images that are graphic in content, um, execution and tortured bodies. So just letting you know if that kind of thing makes you uncomfortable, there will be some of that. Yes. So I'm gonna kind of just jump in. Um, I kind of have been thinking a lot about living in a media saturated economy and what it means to kind of be removed from my culture in Iran or in the Middle East and growing up here. So I didn't learn how to speak English until I was about six, and I grew up in Ohio in like soybean country. So in that, after 9-11, I started kind of really realizing the filtering of what was happening in the Middle East through an American lens. And my parents were really kind of trying to tell me what was happening through a non-Western lens. So it was a really conflicting story. How do we receive information? What news source do we subscribe to? Do we watch CNN and think we're like kind of liberal? Or do we watch Fox News? Or do we watch both to understand both sides? Is it MSNBC or Al Jazeera? Are we watching like looking at Russian media to try to figure out like what's going on on the other side? Irregardless, every single news source kind of spins things in their own way, shape, or form. And is there a way to actually fully understand the truth? I don't really think so. <laughs> so in that, I started thinking about how social media has kind of shaped this and looking at that for kind of looking at data, images, and mining these things to build my own variations of how we could access the news. So when I started in photo in 2013, this is the first piece that I made. So I kind of figured I'd start with this. Um, I was thinking about gross domestic product reports as an indicator of a country's wealth, agriculture. Um, the GDP of Iran is 98% petroleum and oil export, which is what we know it for. I mean, I grew up watching the news or whatever news was on and hearing about the nuclear trade agreement and oil. And that's what Iran was known for. And, you know, the crazy government. And there's so much more to that culture that I feel like wasn't getting across. And I was like, okay, maybe I could try to make a portrait of a country through trades. So my first image was GDP Iran. Um, the other 2% is made up of agriculture, which is primarily pomegranates and pistachios, which are displayed in this image. So I made this. I thought it was you know, like really seductive, and it was pretty, but it wasn't doing enough. So I wanted to get a little bit more aggressive. And so I decided that I wanted to start mining some of the stories that my parents told me. So my mom um, was imprisoned and raped and tortured at the hands of the Iranian government because she was you know, speaking her mind and against the totalitarian regime that came into power in 1981. My father was as well. Um, in Iran, oftentimes, you know, if you're familiar with the government or the regime, women really don't have the rights to actually like, say or speak their minds freely. So in that, my mom would always kind of relate her experience to that of like a lamb. So when you slaughter a lamb in Iran for like a meal, you oftentimes um, beautify it before you slit its throat. So eyeliner, we call it sorme. You put sorme on its eyes. And then you put a sugar cube in its mouth to kind of like satiate it or placate it before slitting its throat. And my mom always referenced that as an action of similar to revolution. Every time that revolution has occurred in Iran, it's been like the sugar cube being placed in the little mouths of the population. So I started kind of playing around with that. Thought it was pretty aggressive, but still too pretty. So I kind of started deciding, all right, if I'm thinking about using color backdrops, if I'm thinking about building these stories or information, how am I referencing these things? 
And the first thing I started thinking about was color revolutions. The idea was invented by the Soviets in the 50s in thinking about the idea that if we ascribe a color to a political movement, it's an easier and more digestible way to understand or get on board with something. So you might not know what the color green represents, but you see your friend that you think is on the right side of an issue wearing green, who's supporting the green revolution, and you might then wear green too. It's kind of like, you know, you might have a sign in someone's yard that says vote yes on issue four. And let's say you live in a neighborhood where everyone has similar ideals or politics. So you see your neighbor Joe on one side has vote yes on issue four, your neighbor on the other side has a vote yes for issue four, and you go to the polls and you don't read what issue four actually is, but you trust your neighbors. So you're like, okay, well, I didn't do the research, so I'm just gonna vote yes on issue four. And that's the same idea of color revolution. So I started thinking about these colors as indicators of these movements happening across the Middle East and how to kind of bring them into the work. So the Green Revolution was a big thing that happened around 2008, 2009 in Iran. So it was called the Twitter Revolution. A lot of people were streaming, you know, like posting photos of themselves um, in protest, after protest, after being brutalized, kind of broadcasting locations of where there might be police on a street or watch out, there's tear gas at, you know, this square, Engelab Square. And so I decided um, then at that moment at Cranbrook, this is still my first year, that I wanted to start making images that were referencing these colors, but also referencing these politicians. And at the same time, also referencing the idea of spring, the Arab spring, which is a very homogenizing term. Arab is like a large kind of net that's being cast over the Middle East when Iranian people aren't Arab at all. But this was still kind of something that was lumped into that movement. So the Green Revolution, I'm kind of hinting at um, party supplies, at the doctrines of political parties. Um, this is Sumak, Somar, which is a symbol of the spring. We have a new year in the spring called Noruz, which means new day. So you set a table of seven things that represent the coming of the spring. So thinking about that celebration as a reference to the Arab Spring as a terminology. Um, a balloon, so... Um, my favorite, Ahmadi Nejad, who was the president at the time, gave a speech right after the revolution at Columbia University where, they said, where he said, there's no gay people in Iran. That's not very true. Um, so I kind of wanted to point at that in some way, shape, or form, thinking about having him sucking on a balloon, but also using the two fingers that you would use for like a peace sign, but also to masturbate with jacking off the balloon at the same time. Made this piece, everyone in my class thought I was you know, making a party scene for Larry David. Um, they didn't realize that that was the president of Iran at the time, and that was kind of a big moment for me. I was like, okay, people don't know who these political figures are unless either you're telling them or they're familiar with them. We're very much in tune with the politicians that we see through Western media. So figured if they didn't, you know, know who Ahmadinejad was from watching the news, maybe it's important that I start kind of changing or shifting how I'm displaying these people. So I started thinking about source imagery. Around that time, I was in touch a lot with my family. Um, so my parents are here and my sister's here, but all of my family is still in Iran besides that. And a lot of them are politically active, engaged in protests, and I started talking to them um, you know, through encrypted servers, asking them what's going on, and they were putting me in touch with their friends. And their friends were sending me photos because they don't have a way to actually like, get the word out to others, you know, internet is blocked, there's ways around it, but they were sending me photographs. So I started thinking about, is it possible to use these photographs of these people that they're sending me with their consent as a means for source imagery in my own photography? So I'm gonna kinda go through a few that I got. This man was found with his partner, who was also a male. Um, they were publicly beaten and lashed, because you're not allowed to be gay. This is his partner. This was a student that was protesting um, the government, just openly protesting. Their student pr protests quite often. Another woman that was beaten publicly during protest. And the Iranian government really uses force and brutality as a means of instilling fear in its population. So how can you scare someone into behaving? And that's exactly what they're trying to do. So executions are oftentimes public, and you take your children to see them. So by saying, you know, this person did something wrong, and now we're gonna watch them be executed, maybe you won't do the same thing, or you're scared enough to not do the same thing. So 
So in 2014, the United States stopped selling cranes to Iran because they realized that they were using cranes as methods of executions. Crane-style executions are extremely different than a gallows style. In a gallows style execution, you knock the gallows out from someone's feet. It takes about 30 seconds to die. Still definitely not humane. But in a crane-style execution, you slowly raise the body, and it, takes, it could take minutes till you choke to death. So this is another means. This is a public activity. You take your family to see it, and it's another means of instilling fear. Prisoners in line. And some of these images are actually being sent to me by human rights lawyers on the ground as well. And then during the Green Revolution, there's also these forums that um, the Basij, the paramilitary. So there's kind of tentacles of the government. And these tentacles, the paramilitary, are kind of always like neighborhood militia. So let's say you live in a suburb and there's 10 houses in your suburb. At least one of those 10 houses are going to be a member of the Basij or the paramilitary. They're spies. They're meant to watch, you know, and see what's happening around them and report back. So the Basij was always, you know, in protest taking photos. And they'll circle these photos, as you can see, and say, if you could identify this person, we'll reward you in some way, shape, or form. In 2009, after the revolution, there's also, I was following a lot of forums, you know, where can you confirm casualties? What are their names? And, you know, of course, like, the interface on these things is going to look a lot, you know, better designed now. But <laughs> when this was happening in 2009, this was just like a means of like getting information. I remember for the first time um, when I was growing up in Ohio around 2008, 2009, um, the Green Revolution was happening. CNN, um, which was the most liberal you could really get in Ohio at the time, was showing this stream or this video, pixelated of course, because you have to pixelate anything that's graphic and content, of the student, Neda Ara Sultan, and she was protesting. This is when the revolution was happening and it was a rigged election. And so she was protesting with her professor and her father on the streets and she was shot. And the video is uh, 52 seconds long and in that 52 second video, we see Neda fall to the ground and bleed out and die. And so I was thinking a lot about also the like permanence of that video and in a media saturated economy, how we kind of circulate these videos and is that as traumatic when you see a moving image, when you could fast forward and rewind and watch something over and over and over, what does that mean for the body? What does that mean for the person and what does that mean for us as an audience? Are we implicated in that violence in some way, shape or form or are we actually like participating in it in some way, shape or form by watching that video? And so I started thinking about creating source images from these videos. So the first kind of image that I made, this was my second year at Cranbrook, that I felt like was finally starting to get there was this image of Neda. So these are screen grabs of her face from the video, from every 10 seconds of the video, and arranged to kind of create these still life scenes. So again, green is a reference to the Green Revolution, party supplies, hinting at the doctrines of political parties. Sugar cubes referencing revolution, the mortar of the bricks being oil, the gross domestic product report of Iran. And then in the, fr in the forefront is sombol, which is a symbol of spring, it's hyacinth. So it's something we put on our table for the celebration. And I kinda decided that fragmenting the body and kind of treating it similarly to a cyborg, a collaged and cut individual was a way that I wanted to continue like working. What does it mean to dismember a body? You know, it's paper and it's photographic, but to cut into it physically is a violent act. And what does it mean to cut into these physical, physically cut into these images of these people that have already been brutalized or tortured or abused? Um, in a lot of this process, I'm always in touch with family members, unless it's politicians, then I don't really give a fuck. So this is, um, this is called Happy Birthday, Mr. President. So the 35th anniversary of the revolution, um, this is Ahmadinejad being feminized because that's another way, you know, you feminize your sacrifice. Stoning is a large means of execution still upheld in Iran. Um, and the camel cigarette is kind of like a nod to orientalization. So a symbol of the East kind of manufactured for the West, exotifying it. Um, the flag in Iran before the revolution was Shiro Shamshir, so it's a lion holding a sword, it's an ancient symbol. Um, when the Islamic Republic came into power 
1981, they changed the flag. So the middle of the flag now says Allah, which means God, signifying them as the Islamic Republic. And with that regime came a lot of oppression, so I kind of figured I would make my own version of a flag. Uh, so this is my kind of banana split toilet paper party paper mache flag that I ended up printing as a flag. I think my thesis book is bound in it, but I haven't seen my thesis book yet, so who knows. Um, I was also at the same time while looking at Twitter and social media um, on the Iranian side was also looking at means of, of ways that information was distributed. So like in Occupy Wall Street, people were distributing information on how to protect yourself against tear gas things you can do like if you're in protest. And the same thing was happening in Iran. Instead of you know, saying that you could put Maylocks in your eyes or spray, um, in Iran, a lot of these forums I was reading were saying if you, there's tear gas on this corner and this corner. If you're going to go there, get some onions, cut them up, rub them in your eyes, and smash a bottle of Coca-Cola and put it on a towel and put it on your eyes before you go into the protest because those are things that protect you from lacrimatory agents, which are tear gas agents. So I was thinking a lot about what are safety devices against protest and how can I display that in a still life type of form. These are the images of execution that I was showing you previously. So I'm building these sets um, using kind of what I'm calling a symbolic lexicon, reusing a lot of the same images over and over, trying to narrate a story and weaving them in and out, making the images kind of work together. The series, this series is called National Anthem. So it references that the national anthem of the country has been changed three times, each time suiting a more oppressive regime that has come into power. Very light content, I know. It gets a little bit more funny at the end, I promise. Um, this is an image um, as a reference to white torture. Another, the Soviets are the masters of torture. So white torture is a sensory deprivation technique um, that my mom actually underwent. You, instead of putting someone in like a dark chamber, you put them in an all white room and completely cover them with you know, white so they can't see their own skin. And oftentimes for women that are coming into the system, they're completely covered in shaving cream and also shaved bare to make them more pleasurable to the male prison guards. So these are the executioners. Um, they're kind of being camouflaged in some way, shape, or form. This is persimmon, which is actually a fruit of the winter, which was actually a lot of the period of time that my mom was in prison, and then shaving cream with um, my pubes thrown on it. That was a fun one to make. Um, these are some of the images that I was getting from the women, or people that were sending them to me via Twitter. So this woman um, asked that her face wouldn't be displayed so she could be protected, but she wanted me to show this image of her body. So this is her after being brutalized in a protest. Another man that had been, had his face beaten in. Um, his relative sent this to me. Again, pomegranates kind of playing on the gross domestic product reports. In 2014, um, 12 women had acid thrown on their faces for not wearing their hijabs correctly. So this is a very common thing, eye for an eye. Um, they had the choice that if they wanted to, you know, throw acid on the face of the people that, you know, threw acid on them because this wasn't a government sanctioned thing that they could and all of them decided not to. But they did send me photos of themselves before the acid attacks and after. So these are kind of thinking about acid facials. Uh, this is an image of Rehana Jabari. She was executed um, in 2014 for attacking her rapist. So I was also thinking a lot about women's bodies and rights and not having you know, the rights to your own body under that regime, and which is still the current regime. Another acid burn victim. Again, gross domestic product reports. And just like a little in on how they're set up. They're really shitty. They're built tabletop, they're constantly falling apart. At least the series is built tabletop. Held up by sticks and bricks and tape. I think a lot about the act of photographing as like an aggressive act. Um, I mean, first off, thinking about historically the camera as you know, a kind of phallic thing, um, and also a male-dominated genre. It's the you know, history of photography has been dominated by straight white men for so long. And what does it mean to take a camera out into the field and photograph others? Um, does it objectify them? Are you using their bodies? And what does it mean for the camera lens to insert itself into that situation? It's kind of a phallus in a sense, inserting itself. So what does it mean to create 
things for the lens? Is it a more internal act? Um, and what happens when you're taking a three-dimensional form and photographing it at f22, making everything sharp? You're making everything on the same plane, and that's another aggressive act that you're committing against these images. But I also try to shoot them like product photography. So in this, you know, actually I'll rewind. In this, I'm thinking a lot also about like how we receive news. It's not fun like watching the news and seeing like brutalized bodies. Like, and oftentimes some people can't handle it. You don't want to watch people, you know, being brutalized. You don't want even when you see like the pixelated images. It's like, oh, this is too much. I have to turn it off. I can't watch. Like, unless you're really into like the pornographic idea of watching executions, you know, it's not something you really want to contend with that often. And so I started thinking about creating the aesthetics as a means of a Trojan horse. You know, does everyone, I'm sure everyone knows the Trojan horse analogy, right? Yeah. Okay. So thinking about what's a way to slip into someone's conscious and thinking about photographing these like product shots, it, like advertising, um, colorful, slick, seductive as a means for people to be like, oh, like I really like the colors in this and the oil looks really like drippy. Is that chocolate sauce? Or, oh, like I like that pink face, but then you realize, you know, it's brutalized, you realize it's pixelated. And so all of these images that I'm printing are pixelated because it kind of references their web-based origins. I'm not pixelating them, but I'm upscaling them. So it references that they came from the web. That's my Trojan horse analogy. So yeah, I'm shooting with soft boxes, you know, similar to how you would shoot like food photography. And then, so this is kind of like the end of like Cranbrook for me. I left Detroit, I moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and I had a bigger studio and I was like terrified about making work and continuing to make work. Um, my mentor Liz Cohen told me the first five years out, you have to like make work constantly and just not do anything else. And I was like, all right, like fuck, what am I gonna do? I had access, I was teaching at RISD and I had access to a 44 inch printer and I decided that I wanted to start making sculptural photographs. And this whole, this all kind of started because I was looking at a lot of um, social psychology. Are you guys familiar with the Albert Bandera social psychology Bobo doll experiment? Does anyone know it? So in 1962, the first phase of this experiment, the Bobo doll experiment, Bobo dolls are those um, clown shaped kind of punching bags or like clown dolls. They're um, like thin at the top and they kind of get like, they have a neck and then they get bulby at the bottom and you could like, they're weighted so you push them and they kind of come back at you. So in 1962, 1963, Bandura did this experiment with children. There's two test groups of children in the first version of the experiment, 20 kids in each group. The first 20 kids get to go into a room that's filled with various toys. Building blocks, you know, crayons, coloring books, um, like toy water gun, Bobo doll, whatever. Out of this 20, out of these 20 kids that go into the room, they haven't been given a prompt or anything. They go in the room and not a single one pays attention to the Bobo doll. The second group of children, 20 children, before going into the room, watches a video of a woman behaving aggressively towards just the Bobo doll, ignoring all of the other toys in the room. So you watch this video of her, she goes into the room, she pushes the doll, she takes the toy gun, she holds it up to the doll, and I mean, it's a no-brainer. Kids are sponges. They observe adults, and they behave the way that they see their adult figures behaving. But this was in an experiment form. Um, a way to kind of show and prove that. And I started thinking a lot about the act of public executions in Iran. By executing primarily women um, in front of large crowds, this endorses state aggression on femme bodies. So what's a means of kind of equating these bodies to these Bobo dolls? So I started thinking about sculpting them, turning them into kind of soft stuffed Bobo dolls, not because I want people to punch them, but I kind of want them to have the same implications. So the sets got a lot bigger. They still remained really shitty. So still party supplies, taping them up to the wall, printing out large photographs, the backdrops. And in this series, I was getting in touch. You know, it kind of also started when I was thinking about, you know, in National Anthem, I was working with a large range of human rights violation victims. But I was, you know, thinking a lot again about my mom, what happened to her, and how she actually got away, and how a lot of these women don't get away and started getting in touch with human rights lawyers on the ground that were documenting women that are being executed in Iran that aren't recorded. You know, the government doesn't release their names. Amnesty International covers about maybe five to nine a year. Nine last year was like the most I've seen. 
So I really wanted to start kind of getting alternative sources of ways of making these people known. So getting in touch with their families, working with the lawyers, getting in touch with mothers, daughters, sons, husbands. So this is kind of a version of seeing like how I was photographing them and again how the camera flattens everything. So this is Sakina Mohammadi Ashtiani. She was executed because she was um, convicted of killing her husband. It was actually her brother who killed her husband for money, but you know, because a woman did it, or because a man did it, of course you blamed it on a woman and you got away with it. This is Shahla Jahan. Um, she was convicted, she was executed for drug trafficking. So you know, like here, I'm not saying that our prison industrial complex is great, but usually they don't kill you for drug trafficking. I mean, if you're a person of color, they'll imprison you for like ever, but you know, here it's execution pretty imminently. Delara Darabi, she was executed because she um, put information against the government on her Facebook. So that's a very trafficked kind of space. This is Delara Darabi again. She was in prison for a really long time. So I worked with two images of her given to me by her sister and one by her mother. Tarane Musavi was a student protester. This is Rehana Jabari, who I mentioned earlier, um, whose mother I'm in very close contact with. Um, but she was executed in 2014, like I mentioned, for attacking her rapist. And this is her mother, Shole Pakravan. So she sent me images of herself after Rehana was executed, um, taking flowers to her grave. This is her on her last phone call with Rehana. She had a very long um, imprisonment. Mariam Akbari was stoned to death for adultery. Rohale Zamani, another drug trafficking violation. And in that, I always, you know, kind of get asked, like, are you ever going to show your correspondences? And I never do because I want to protect the people that, you know, have decided to give me that information. But one thing that they all did say that I could do is distribute the logs, the execution logs. So the project's kind of taken multiple forms. Um, I made a zine of all of the logs, and Rehana's mother gave me all of her um, letters from prison that I translated into English and put excerpts of in the zine. It's really low quality. I'm thinking about like easy distribution, what spaces things could be distributed in. But recently, the new museum did a commission um, through Rhizome um, called The Download. So it's publicly available on the new museum's website. Um, it's the download number six. And I was kind of asked to consider how this information could be distributed and organized on a desktop and in a way that's somewhat egalitarian. You know, not everyone has the socioeconomic capability of getting the internet. It costs money, or you have to have a device. Um, you might go to a library and be able to get it publicly, but like still, that takes a specific, you know, type of class or education level in some way, shape, or form. But overall, it's pretty easily accessible to those that do have the internet at their fingertips. And so you can download this information. It's a series of nesting folders, and each folder is kind of named after a segment of one of Rehana's letters. And you open up these you know, folders that include images. Here's just kind of a screen grab of all of the women that I've worked with. Here's the execution records, segments of letters, letters that um, her mother was sending to me, voice messages that I actually have gotten from her mother, but also translated into English. Um, and then you end up with the two photographs. But no matter what you do, whatever order you go in, the ending is always the same, which is Rehana's execution. So that was really heavy work. <laughs> it was like kind of really starting to wear on me at the end of that series. I still actually want to continue doing the series because, of course, this, these executions are still happening. But I was thinking a lot about what makes these things possible. What are these networks or these systems that make you know, this type of aggression and this type of behavior from a government happen. And outside of religious dictatorships, there's also the way that global trade and capitalism affects human rights. So I kind of wanted to go into that, you know, direction just for a little bit to lighten it up. It's not that light, but it's lighter. Um, so I started thinking about something, and this one, people ask me this all the time, and I'm sure for people that are making quote unquote personal work or if you're an artist of color and you're thinking about your homeland in some way, shape or form or your background, people are like, oh, are you always gonna make work about like your culture? 
are you always going to make work about, like, your story? And that was really kind of bothering me. I was like, oh, am I, like, getting pegged as, like, the quote-unquote, like, Iranian artist, like, the Iranian woman artist that makes, um, I think a collector once was like, oh, yes, that's the executed woman girl. And I'm like, ooh, like, not, not something that, like, I'm really interested in as, like, a title because that, A, fucked up, but B, limiting. So <laughs> I started thinking about things that Iran is a part of a global network that Iran is a part of, and I started thinking about OPEC, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It was an intergovernmental organization created at the Baghdad Conference in 1960 by Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi, and Venezuela. Um, the five founding members were later joined by 10 other members, Qatar, Indonesia, um, Libya, UAE, Algeria, Nigeria, Ecuador, um, Angola, Gabon, um, Equatorial Guinea and Congo, which recently joined in 2018. So these are OPEC meetings. Again, of course, like an all male dominated industry. Surprise, surprise. Also, looking at this like beautiful app they designed, um, they have all of these like interactive graphs on their OPEC app that you could look at and see, you know, the like trade routes of oil. So these are all of the trade routes for Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. OPEC states that its objective is to coordinate and unify petroleum price policies among member countries in order to secure fair and stable prices for petroleum producers, an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming nations, and a fair return on capital to those investing in the industry. If we follow history, oil in the hands of power-hungry men never creates fair returns or fair capitals. So I'm thinking a lot about these kind of like systems of cronyism that are happening. And then this is just, you know, I always have sketched um, when I think about making a photograph. I am listing and researching everything in depth, but on top of that, also just kind of sketching. Clearly, reason I didn't go into drawing. But, um, you know, I was thinking about the G20 summit, and I was like, oh, what does the G20 summit look like? And I'm like, I bet it's like a frat party. I bet they have one of those, like, you know, multi, like, I've never, I've never been to a frat party before, actually, but... There's the, these like oil, these bongs, you know, beer bongs that have like the giant funnel and like lots of like tubes coming out of them. And I was like, that's what I imagine. I imagine like all of these politicians like on their knees, like drinking out of one of these like beer bongs, but they're it's oil. So this is my G20 Summit oil bong. So medium of exchange is a series of photographs and filmic screenplays set within constructed tableaus that animates relationships between leaders of OPEC countries and the West finding both sides complicit in corruption, warfare, and human rights violations. The works expose corruption and networks of complicity in global oil trade. And I'm kind of wanting to finally approach something with humor because the work was really dark for a while. So I started also thinking about like senior superlatives, um, cutest couple or like most beautiful or most likely to succeed. Um, in 1981, the Gulf Cooperation Council was created. Um, so these are the six Gulf countries that are, you know, friends with the United States, and every single one of these Gulf countries has a port, that, like a U.S. Navy base and an air base, so we can have access to the Middle East in some way, shape, or form. So they're like the cutest couple. They have the trophy. This is uh, General Petraeus kissing Iraq's hand covered in oil. It's called Inauguration. I'm also casting um, femme-identifying bodies to play the roles of these male figures, um, thinking about challenging the normativity of these figures, but also challenging the fact that like these power positions have to be played by male roles. This is um, the OPEC minister of Venezuela as the Shell gasoline goddess. So Shell gasoline gets 78%, um, I believe, of their crude oil products from ports in Venezuela. So also all of these images, these again are constructed sets, I'm casting people to play these roles, making the costumes, but all of these images in the background are of oil fields in that specific country that have been sourced from the OPEC website. So OPEC sends their like, it's kind of like they're trying to do new topographics versions of oil fields, it's super strange. They have like these OPEC photographers that they send to these like sites and they're like, oh, make this look really glorified, but also make it look like really basic bitchy in some way, shape or form. And so they're taking these like really like, pretty beautiful images of like oil, oil fields, which are pretty disgusting. So these are the printed images in the background. And I'm also kind of looking at a lot of current events in this that I think are humorous. 
Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the um, kind of ban on Qatar um, and the Arab boycott, but since Qatar has been kind of banned from the Gulf Cooperation Council, it's decided to retaliate in some way, shape, or form by saying, well, we, wanna, we can't really like, get dairy from anywhere because we're blockaded, so we're going to do something that no one else in the Middle East does. We're going to get, you know, like 40,000 cows, bring them to the middle of the desert, build them an air-conditioned facility, and then decide to have a booming dairy industry in the middle of the desert, which I find hilarious and really fucked up. And they also are hosting the World Cup in 2022. So they have these, like, equivalent of Got Milk commercials where they have Qatari, like, soccer players drinking Qatari milk. So I decided, and in the same time, of course, like, the World Cup is also super fucked up. Like, sorry if you love soccer, but FIFA's like evil. Hate to break it to you. Um, and they're doing, there's a lot of like labor laws that are going on. So a lot of like South Asian labor is, you know, like people are dying. I think over a thousand and one deaths have happened while these people are building these stadiums and like conditions that are not okay. They're barely getting any pay. So I'm also thinking about what does it mean to treat workers like turf? What does it mean for them to be the grass or to be like stepped on? Um, so creating kind of this like soccer field with the plays, the arrows kind of referencing the different plays, the cows and the milk and the body. Again, starting to think about product photography, creating these tableaus that look like they could be selling milk, maybe, and soccer, maybe. <laughs> this is... Um, the oil OPEC minister of Qatar. One of my favorites, the um, love affair between Rumsfeld and Cheney and their $100 bill towels. Another personal favorite of mine, um, has anyone seen this photo? Oh, I love this one. For some reason right now, well now that Khashoggi is like executed, I guess people finally think Saudi is evil, but um, They've been fucked for a really long time. Again, hate to break it to you. Um, but this was in 2016. Um, the Crown Prince of Saud decided to empty out this British Airways jet and fly 83 of his Falcons personally with their own personal handlers on the plane. Um, so Saudi is the richest oil nation. They have the most money out of all of the OPEC countries and they have the, some of the most egregious human rights violations. And so this is what they're spending their money on. So this is um, bin Salman, Crown Prince bin Salman, and his heart boxers with his falcon. Um, in the background is the Gahwar oil field, which is the largest field in the world. And I kind of wanted to start thinking about like the you know, falcons complicit in some way, shape, or form, even though they don't mean to be. So instead of wearing those sensory deprivation caps, the, the falcon's wearing a kefeya, and he's wearing a necklace that says Allah. Here's another one. Um, the UN was blackmailed into removing Saudi Arabia from the blacklist after just a week. So Ban Ki-moon, who was the then head of the United Nations, decided to put Saudi Arabia on the blacklist for what was going on in Yemen. And within a week, Saudi retaliated and said, if you want to put us on the blacklist, we're going to cut off not just our oil supply, but we're going to cut off our monetary supply to the United Nations. And so it turns out, and this ends up being a screen in one of the screenplays that you'll see, um, that Ban Ki-moon was like, oh, well, there, there's many more serious issues going on in the world, and uh, we must, you know, we can take them off the blacklist for a while. Well, six months later, Saudi is the head of the United Nations. Yeah. This is uh, Khalid Al-Fali, who is the head of OPEC in Saudi Arabia, um, kind of crushing. He's doming Ban Ki-moon. So he's a dom. You can see the capital D with, like, the backslash, and Ban Ki-moon's the sub with the lowercase s. Also thinking, these are just more of my like brain maps and sketches through my research. So in 1975, um, Angola like, was part of this coup d'etat that the United States government kind of initiated to gain control of the MPLA, which was one of the four governmental factions. Um, those other three factions were Soviet friendly, and of course in 75, Kissinger wanted us to stray away from any type of Soviet influence whatsoever. So we wanted to realize, you know, or figure out a way to get control of Angola, not just because they have oil, but because they're, they have diamonds. So I thought about what would a proposal look like between Henry Kissinger on bended knee with a diamond and oil proposing to 
Kundbatelo, who is the OPEC minister of Angola. Timely again, um, the sanctions were removed from Iran under the Obama presidency, which I, I, again, I wasn't sure if I agreed with or didn't agree with. It had a lot of contentious issues, but the sanctions have now been reimposed during this current presidency. So I'm thinking about the sanctions collar. Uh, Carter, the peanut farmer, in their bedroom wedding honeymoon scene with um, the OPEC minister of the United Arab Emirates, which we trade $7.2 billion of aircrafts with every year. There's some peanuts in there too, though. I think these are lighter hearted than the other ones, but you know, it's gonna be just me. Um, this is the OPEC minister of Iran, Bijan Zangane, um, kind of illustrating the lion and the sword of the flag. Um, again, the new topographic sea almost kind of photographs of the oil fields, plush lion. Fun fact, when I was here at Cranbrook, I got to rent an actual lion from the Science Institute, but I couldn't figure out how the fuck to use it in my work in time, and now I don't know if I could do it again. So this is when I was like, oh, I can't get that real lion rug anymore. I'm gonna order this plush lion from Bulgaria. So this is how it ended up in there. And then grapes being another gross domestic product report. And um, something that's just kind of recently made me mad, especially with now with the Khashoggi thing, is um, this article that was written by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, um, Saudi Arabia's Arab Spring at last. The crown prince has big plans for society. So again, I'm thinking a lot about like this idea of the Arab Spring, the homogenization of like what a spring is, especially because all of these governments function extremely differently from one another. And when we give a term like Arab Spring, lump all of these countries together, do we actually know what's happening in them independently? Who the people or the society is? What are the issues they're facing specifically? And um, I remember when women in Saudi apparently got the right to drive, I got like flooded with DMs. And people were like, wow, Shada, did you hear? Like women can drive now, isn't that great? And I'm like, ooh, like really? Like that's like, okay. I mean like I get that that's a positive thing, but let's think about it, what women can drive. What does it take to have a car? Money. So it's like women in positions of socioeconomic class and power are the ones that are able to finally get cars. And not even all of them are able to get cars. Some of them are being denied licenses still. So this idea of like creating a progressive society isn't actually happening, but it's smoke and mirrors. You know, the Saudi crown prince is trying to do these things to make himself seem progressive in some way, shape, or form, while this is still happening in Yemen. Meanwhile, time has, you know, fortunately time chose the Me Too campaign for the person of the year because that's the editors that chose that, but there's also the People's Choice Award. So on the website for Time Magazine before, you know, they say, this is who we decided to have, people can vote on who they think the person of the year is. And 24% of our population, our people worldwide, decided that Bin Salman should have been the man of the year. So I decided that I kind of wanted to create like a little homage to Time Magazine's cover. So that's Bin Salman with his uh, cafe a bikini top with an American sword because America is extremely complicit in this piercing um, the Yemeni children. And I guess that's on a darker note to end on, but that's the last slide I got. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. <laughs>